we are going to have a fun morning, and we are going to be just having a moment to speak about worship this morning. And it's something that I'm very passionate, and something um, I'm very, I like to believe that I live, is <laughs> worship, a life of worship, a walk of worship in his presence. I'm excited to bring that word. Before I do, I wanna show you a photo of our gracious daughters in the Netherlands. That's where I was last week. I don't know if it's good. There we go, amazing. How incredible is that photo? We had 350 women show up for Gracious Daughters, our first ever Gracious Daughters in the Netherlands. Like how good is God? Amazing. Um, and it wasn't just a, a, a church and a room full of women, it was a room full of His presence and the Holy Spirit moved, and women were ministered to. Um, and I really believe a lot of women that came weren't even members of the church, they were brought as a friend, and that's always been my heart for Gracious, that it builds the church, that it plugs people into church and shows them just how beautiful Jesus is. Um, and it's always an outreach tool that you can invite your world to. So when I hear testimonies of people that were ministered to that aren't even in our church, that came to visit, that got invited, I'm like, yes, that's what it's all about. Um, so I really believe it's just the beginning for Europe. Amen. First, gracious daughters in Netherlands, yeah. more is gonna come, and I told them to make room for next year because the building was too small. We had to turn people away. There was no more space, and next year we just gotta make room. More room, because more women are gonna come because God is doing something amazing and special. So I'm so expectant, and you're a part of that. I know like you here in SA, but as I go, I'm, you're with me. You're with me. And when I'm here, they're here as well, because we're one church. Um, and um, so just know when you see me there, you're with me in spirit and in my heart, um, and you're also represented there. So it's really special. So, heart of worship. Are you ready? Are your hearts open? Okay, amazing. Our hearts, I believe, in life, in this world, but especially after COVID, especially going through COVID, I've just, I just also like a sense, like so many people's hearts have become hard, like callous like there's calluses on our hearts, it's become a little bit, and it's because it was hard. It's because there was pain. There was because it was loneliness. There was a lot of hard times in COVID and maybe even now. And when we face hard times, and sometimes maybe we put the Lord there, our hearts build up walls to protect ourselves. But the problem with a hard heart, a hardened heart, it stops us from receiving really well. Receiving his love, sensing his closeness, because if we have our walls up, we've gotta protect ourselves, we've gotta do, we've gotta, we've gotta control the situation, we've gotta fix the situation. But that's not what the Lord wants. He wants you to have a soft heart, pliable, that he can just be there, he can come close, he can do heart surgery, pull out the roots that aren't supposed to be there, remove stones that have come in, he wants it soft and pliable so that he can work and be close to us. Worship is God's design. Worship is how we walk with the Lord every day of our lives. How we walk in his presence, how we sense his presence, how we engage his presence. He's always there. But worship is not natural. It's not natural. Our natural flesh, our natural selves, we want to complain. We want to talk negative, talk about the symptom, talk about the problem. Worship is a choice. Interesting. Worship, we need to learn. We need to learn to worship, to lean into God when it's hard, to lift up His name when we're hearing every other name. Worship is an attitude of the heart. Worship changes our hearts. 
Worship is a key to unlock his presence. Full access, 24 seven. It's interesting, every time in Israel, when it's documented they were not worshiping and singing and praising, it's their greatest, greatest, most success documented in the Word of God. Isn't that interesting? David is called the sweet psalmist of Israel. And you know, when you read the Psalms, you hear he's attacked on every side. It doesn't mean life's perfect and he's just writing psalms and songs to Jesus and it's amazing. He's being attacked, he's in battle. But then he sings, lifts up thanksgiving, lifts up the name of Jesus, lifts up how good he is after crying out to him. And a time and time again, supernatural doors open. Supernatural doors open. God makes a way for him supernaturally. And I really believe that's what happens when we worship the Lord. When we lift up his name, God opens up the supernatural. We step into the supernatural, from a natural perspective into a supernatural path, way, a way in the wilderness. Acts 15, it says, in the last days. Do you believe we're in the last days? We're in the last days. And it says, God said, rebuild the tabernacle of David in the last days. What is the tabernacle of David? It's worship, it's praise, it's thanksgiving. Why? Because it's gonna bring a harvest of souls. It's gonna be a witness to the world as we go out thanksgiving and praising and worshiping and lifting up the name of Jesus. People are gonna come in, people are gonna get saved and people are gonna encounter Jesus. The tabernacle of David. And I really believe this. Where God is getting ready to take you, to take Redemption Church, worship is required. His presence is what's going to be needed. I believe worship is going to carry some people to the other side of that battle you're facing right now. That mountain that's in front of you. I believe worship will bring about a breakthrough in your heart today. I believe it's gonna tear down some walls that have hardened, open up some blockages or lock doors from hurt and pain that has happened in your life. I believe it is gonna make a way for you in your wilderness that you're faced with right now. In Jesus' name. The Greek word for worship in the New Testament is proskuneo. Pros kuneo. And I love this worship word in Greek because of the description of this word, because it just describes the heart of worship so well. The first description was to kiss toward, to kiss toward the Lord, to come close. The second one is to submit in reverence, to surrender. Kissing. His feet was the third description, which really means thankfulness and to bless the Lord. And the last one was to touching the hem, touching his hem, which really means to take from him, to come to him in your need. So worship is to come close. And I also love what it means that what kiss represents because kiss was spoken about. The kiss signifies coming near. Kiss signifies a union. Kiss signifies affection. A kiss on the feet signifies thankfulness. It expresses one's life that is improved because of the one being kissed. Worship, to come close, to kiss toward. It's intimacy, it's closeness with our Father. Jesus, our Savior. But now it doesn't always mean you feel close. Some of you might have walked in here today and go like, that sounds amazing, but I feel I've never felt further away from God. I feel so far away from God right now. 
I don't even know how to worship. That's okay. It's okay. Because there's a great example in Acts 16 of Paul and Silas. And it says this. A mob quick, quickly formed against Paul and Silas and the city officials ordered them and stripped and beaten with wooden rods. They were severely beaten and then they were thrown into a prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape. So the jailer put them into an inner dungeon and clamped their feet. And around midnight, now I don't know, maybe some of you can relate to that in some sense in your life right now. Like you are just feel like you are pressed on every side. You feel like your feet have been clamped. You feel like your song has been stolen. You feel like it's the 11th hour and you feel like giving up. And I, re I really believe that's where Paul and Silas were. They were at their wit's ends hurting, beaten up, bruised. And around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. They were singing the Psalms of David. And other prisoners were listening. Suddenly there was a massive earthquake and the prison was shaken to its foundations. The doors immediately flew open and every prisoner was freed. The jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open, he assumed the prisoners escaped, so he drew his sword to kill himself. But Paul shouted, stop, don't kill yourself, we are here. The jailer called for the lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down trem trembling before Paul Silas. And he brought them out and he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, along with everyone in your household. And they shared the word of the Lord with him and with all who lived in his household. And at that very hour, the jailer cared for them and washed their wounds. Then he and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. He brought them into his house and set a meal before them. And he and his entire household rejoiced because they believed in God. And I really believe there are times in our life where worship isn't coming natural. It's not coming natural, it's hard. Life is feeling hard, it's feeling difficult. But you know what this says to us? It says we can choose to worship. We can choose to worship and lift up his name even when it's hard, even when we're feeling like we're defeated. That we can lift and turn our eyes onto the one who suffered for us. They decided to sing the Psalms of David. They could have sat there and complained, really. They could have complained. This is unfair. It's over. We're done for. But they turned to Jesus and they probably cried out and had a good cry. And they would just said, Jesus, you're good. You're faithful. You're still faithful. That was stepping into the supernatural. Worship takes our eyes off our suffering, our struggles, our heartbreaks puts it on Jesus, puts it on the one who suffered and bore all our sickness, all our disease, all our lack on the cross. It puts it on him. In our discouraged dark moments, we have to make a choice. We get to make a choice. We get to. We get to choose to worship, not just on a Sunday. Yeah, we come in the room, we can worship, but then we leave and that's, that was our worship for the week. No, it's a life of worship. It's a heart of worship. It's a walk of worship with our Savior because he wants to be close to us. He never turns his back on us. He never takes a step back from us. He never turns his face away from us, no matter how much we fail him, no matter how much we turn our back away from him. Whenever there's distance, it's because we've moved away, not, not him. Where I learned to worship in my battles, in the storms of life, was when I was a little girl in my mom's car. 
So my dad wasn't saved. So it was a little bit awkward to play worship in the house, and he was kind of like, what is that? It was just, it just didn't really go well. So we're like, okay, that's all right. But in my mom's car, I don't think we ever listened to the radio, ever, or the news. It was our worship time. On the way to school, on the way back from school, to the shops, wherever we were going, it was worship. We would just lift up the name of Jesus. And you know what? Some days were hard. Sometimes we faced challenges. There were times my dad was fighting for his life on a ventilator. The worship didn't get put off. That worship stayed, it actually got louder. It became a war cry in our car. It was the good days, it was the bad days. We chose to worship Jesus. We chose because he's good, he's faithful, and we remembered who he is. He hasn't changed, he hasn't moved, and he hasn't brought anything bad towards us, only good. And when we worship, we remember. We remember he's a good God. We remember he's faithful. He's trustworthy. He's faithful to his promises. It kept us close. It kept us under his wings. When we felt unsure, when we felt scared, when we felt challenges, in the good days and the bad days, it taught me that. I learned that from my mom because she's a worshiper. And now that I'm older and we've faced our challenges, that's what I do, I worship. I put it louder. In the bath, in the car, wherever I go, worship is on. Especially when it's hard times, I do it more. Because I need to see him and not my problem. I need to make him louder, not the diagnosis. Don't hide your worship. Sometimes we hide our worship from our kids, from our families. Don't hide your worship. Expose your children to you worshiping Jesus. Let them see you raising your hands. Let them see you lifting up his name, even when it's hard, even when you don't know where the next meal is gonna come from. We're still gonna lift up the name of Jesus in our home, in our lives, over our situations, because that has stayed with me for the, for my, until now, <laughs> my whole life. And that's how I fight my battles. Teach your kids how to fight their battles, because life isn't easy, and we live in a fallen world, and we need to equip them how to face challenges. We have everything we need in Jesus. We have everything we need in him, in the finished work, in worship, in the word of God. But let's not keep it from them. Let's expose them. Amen? Amen. Worship. Hannah, my daughter Hannah, she's a worshiper. Because I play worship in my car. And we sing at the top of our lungs, and we are ready for our day. And when we're having a down moment, it's the worship that just picks us up and builds faith in us. When my son was having seizures in front of us consistently and I could not control it, medicine could not fix it, we played worship. We sang worship. And we just felt the presence of God in a room. And the devil was a liar. The devil is a liar. But we felt him. There's nothing better than his presence. No matter how bad the storm is, no matter how bad the diagnosis is, no matter how difficult it feels, his presence is everything, everything. But maybe you're here today and you're like, I'm not even a believer. I'm just here, I don't even know why I'm here. How do I worship a God I don't even know? I feel far from God. How? I wanna share a story with you in Mark 5. Because if he can worship, you can worship. And he was a demon-possessed man. Probably one of the worst demon-possessed men documented in the Bible, I would say. Mark 5. Then they came to the other side of the sea of the country, and when he had come out the boat, meaning Jesus, immediately there met him out of the tombs was a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs, 
which is interesting because tombs was always a dry, dark place. And no one could bind him, not even the chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken into pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. And always night and day, he was in the mountains and the tombs, in the dark, dark places, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus, when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshiped him. He worshiped him. He was a demon-possessed man. This is evidence you can choose to worship Jesus. Even if you don't know him, even if you've been fired, even if you've been oppressed and possessed, you can choose to worship Jesus. So, so can you. And obviously the demon possessed man was set free immediately when he encountered Jesus. But when you're distant with God, when I was distant with God, I have been times where I've also, I faced the world. I've run into the world thinking maybe there's a better plan out there for me and you know, maybe I'll fit in there and chase things and people and look for approval. And it, and it created distance with me and God. Not because he was mad, not because, oh, Tara, you have to, you know, like he's got his finger out at me. No, it was because I moved away. I moved away. God never moves away from us. We feel like he does, but it's not him, it's us. And he chases us down. He's coming after us. He's going after us. All he needs us to do is turn around. Look at him. Receive him. Choose him. Whenever you're ready, he'll wait. He'll follow. He'll never give up. He never gives up up because he loves you. Amen. Making a choice to worship, whether it's in a song or a sacrament, in receiving from him or in giving, it changes your heart. It softens your heart. God doesn't need your worship. He doesn't. It's us that needs it. It's us that needs worship with our Lord. Us, the weak, broken, imperfect, we need it, because we need softened hearts. We need our hearts to be soft, and pliable, and moist, ready to receive His word, His grace. I found sometimes, I've sat in church, and I speak to people, and, I, and then they just tell me like, it's like we weren't sitting in the same room. And I'm like, how did that work? We're sitting under the same sermon. And I really believe sometimes when we have a hardened heart, it just goes, phew. It can't go in. We have to have our hearts open. They have to be soft. If we have a wall there, it's just gonna... Worship, praise, it opens the door. It opens a heart to receive, for the word to penetrate, for the word to go in. It's significant, it's important, it's a part of our walk and receiving from Jesus. But then, what happens if you're questioning God? Do we still worship? Is it still worship? How does God respond to us if we're not worshiping but we're questioning him? God, why? Why me? Why are you this? Why aren't you healing me? Because I've been there with my son, Jonathan. For three years, we had seizures. Every night, multiple. Multiple seizures. No medication could fix him. I couldn't help him. I couldn't stop the seizures, no matter what I did or what I fed him. Nothing worked. And eventually, two and a half years into not sleeping, and just constantly, and honestly, for a child, he is very brave. It, it, 
I mean, constantly at night, he would lose his sight, he would lose his breath, and his body would convulse uncontrollably. And for a child in the dark, in the, and you're trying to sleep, it's, for an adult, it would be a, the worst nightmare, really. Um, and he eventually said to me, Mom, just stop it. Stop praying for me. Put the worship off. It's not working. Your prayers don't work. I don't want it anymore. Well, as a mom, I like nearly fell apart. I was like, oh, what are we going to do? He's angry at God. And I was just reminded in that moment, and even Josh just said to me, he's like, you know what? God understands. He understands. He came to this earth as a man. He knows how hard it is. He knows what we face with. He knows the feelings and emotions you go through, the hardship. He's not standing there going like, why aren't you a perfect Christian? Like, why? He understands and he's gracious and he comes down to you in those moments and pulls you up. He pulls you up, he draws you close. And I love the story about the doubting Thomas because I think it's a perfect example of our God's heart, Jesus' heart to us in those moments. Thomas, sometimes called the twin, one of the 12, was not with them when Jesus came back. The other disciples told him, we saw the master, but he said, unless I see the nail holes in his hands and put my finger in the holes, and stick my hand in his side, I will not believe it. Eight days later, his disciples were again in the room. This time Thomas was with them. Jesus came through the locked doors and stood among them and said, peace to you. Then he focused his attention on the doubting one. He focused attention on Thomas. And he said, come, come close, take your finger and examine my hands. Take your hand and stick it in my side. Don't be unbelieving, believe. Thomas said, my master, my God. Jesus said, so you believe because you've seen with your own eyes? How much even greater the blessing are in store for those who believe without seeing and that is us, amen? Even greater blessing. But the point of this is his heart. He didn't come in and just shake his head and go, you didn't believe. How did you doubt me? He said, come, come close, come close. He comes down to your level and he will pull you up. He will pull you up. He's not mad, he's not cross. He comes to your level but not to leave you in the pit, to pull you up again. We're not called to stay there, but if you're there, he's gracious, he's good, and he's understanding. And you know, my son now, today, I don't know how it changed, I backed off. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna back off, I'm gonna just carry on worshiping Jesus by myself and praying, but I'm not gonna, I'm gonna give him some space. And I can't tell you the day it changed, but that child of mine comes into my room and prays for me now. He speaks shalom peace over me. He speaks Psalm 91 over me. He prays before we preach. He is on fire for Jesus. But it's because Jesus came to him at his darkest moment, at his lowest moment. And he encountered the love and the grace of Jesus. That he, we don't have a mad God. We don't have a savior that's mad at us because we question, because we're low, because we turned our backs. He comes down. And I really believe my son has encountered that because he does it on his own account these days. Praise God. And Jesus will do the same for you if you're there. Jesus is not far. He wants to pull you close to reveal his heart to you. Worship brings us close. It reassures questions in our hearts, doubts in our mind. 
to reveal and remind us who he is. We need to be reminded, especially when it's hard, especially when it's a battle, especially when it's a storm brewing and going on in our lives. We have to remind ourselves who he is. Who is he? What is his character? Because when you know who he is and his character, you will not doubt him. You will not question him. You'll go, he's got this. My Abba has got this. Worship makes us more aware of his presence. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He's our rock. He's stable and he has not moved. And when I was faced with these challenges with my son, with Jonathan, and, and now we've come through and he's doing really well. I've had people go, how did you get through it? Because yes, we know we believe in Jesus and we, we know the word, but practically, what did you do? What must I do? Well, I can only tell you what I did. My thing was worship. It was worship. Sometimes I couldn't listen to a sermon, honestly. But I could put on that worship in my car. I put on the worship in his hospital room. Worship was playing constantly because it took our eyes off the seizures. It took our eyes off the problem. It took our eyes off the doctors and what they were saying, waiting on them, and it put it on Jesus, and it made him big, and it made him loud, because he is worthy, and he is faithful to his promises, and he deserves our praises, and we need to make him big. Psalm 145 was a portion of scripture that I actually read a lot because it constantly spoke about God is gracious and kind and good to all. He didn't say to the good ones, to the faithful ones. He said to all. And I kept reading it, and I know this is a different translation that I'm gonna to read to you now, but I kept, I kept chewing over that. Because the more I got that, he's good to all. It doesn't matter what you do, where you've missed it, you haven't been to church in ages, he will be good to you because he's a good God because that's his character and he's faithful and he's gracious all the time. And I'm just gonna read you a little, little bits from it. And it says, it's Psalm 145. Now and forever my heart bows and worship to you, my King, my God. Every day I will lift up my praise to your name. Our hearts bubble over as we celebrate your fame of your marvelous beauty, bringing bliss to our hearts. We shout with ecstatic joy over your breakthrough for us. You're kind, you're gracious, you're tender-hearted to those who don't deserve it, and very patient with people who fail you. Your love is like a flooding river overflowing its banks with kindness. You are faithful to fulfill every promise you have made. You manifest yourself with kindness in all you do. Weak and feeble ones you will sustain. Those bent over with burdens of shame, you will lift them up. When you open your generous hand, it's full of blessings. You are fair and righteous in everything you do. And your love is wrapped into all your works. And it ends, I will praise you, Lord. Let everyone everywhere join me in praising the beautiful Lord of holiness from now and through to eternity. And there was a song on Psalm 145 and he used to play it in my car. And it was just like, that was my song. Because that's what I needed to know. While my son was in hospital and I couldn't fix him and I was waiting on the Lord, I needed to know. I needed to be reminded, like I knew. But in that moment, there's so many other voices. I needed to remind myself, who is he and what is his character? And I listened and I read this a lot. And that's what worship does. It reminds us 
of his character, who he is, that he's good to all and he's gracious and he's kind and he's loving. He will not leave my son like this. He will not leave you like this. He will not leave you where you're at right now. He loves you too much. Magnify his name. There was a quote I read and I just absolutely love it because I believe it describes worship so beautifully. Worship is bowing, getting your head below your heart. Meaning, heart and spirit take priority over your head. How many of us know that our head often gets in the way? Our doubts, our fears, our questions, our knowledge. Maybe we even know too much. Been Googling way too much. Doubts, fears, bad reports. When we worship, our heart and our spirit takes preference. It gets the loud voice in our situation, not the report, not our fears, not our doubts. It has to submit. That is worship. Worship is where I could sing and weep and cry and cry out to God. It wasn't always beautiful and amazing. I think when we really just encounter that presence, man, it's just like tears and it's not and but you know what it's ministry it's not just about standing here all pretty and raising our hands it's ministry and ministry sometimes doesn't look pretty sometimes it's tears and snot and it's okay but i would come with my need i would come with my brokenness when we come here and worship sometimes we empty we have nothing it's worship. He sees it as worship. He sees it as drawing close. It's more than a song that we sing on a Sunday. It's more than a set list. Worship brings you close. Worship tells you Abba's got this. His word and his presence in our lives changes everything. It changes your circumstance. It changes how you respond to what you're faced with. His presence. Some of us are so busy going, when I get that breakthrough, when Jonathan stops having seizures, our lives are gonna be amazing, it's gonna be great. Then, you know, we're just gonna be good with God and everything will be fine. Some of us are waiting for the promised land when actually the promised land is his presence. His presence is everything we need, everything. What good would it be getting the breakthrough in the promised land without God and his presence in our lives? The promise is not that it, there won't be problems. God doesn't promise there won't be problems or storms or valleys in our lives, but he promises that he will be with you he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He will get you to the other side. Yes. When we get the promise, we get the breakthrough. We get the promised land. It comes. It'll be there. But let's not have our eyes on the promised land. Let's have our eyes on Jesus. Let's have our eyes on his presence in our lives. Be comforted by his presence not his presence. His presence is more powerful than his presence. The only thing certain is he is with you. If you don't believe that, you will lean on something. If you're not gonna lean on Jesus and lean into him, you will lean on yourself, you'll lean on things, you'll lean on money, you'll lean on people, you'll lean on yourself, perfection, and you know, those are all things that can be stolen. They can be taken from you. Actually, they steal from you because no one and no thing, no money is designed to be your savior. Yeah. It's not meant to be a God in your life. Only Jesus, only our Lord Jesus. 
we are to worship in spirit and truth. Worship the Father through the Son and the power of the Holy Spirit. We're to worship. We are created to worship. As human beings, we are always worshiping. But what are you worshiping? What are you worshiping? If it's not Jesus, it will be people and things and money and self and pride. And... But we're designed to worship. Everyone is worshiping. Maybe it's even sport. Just putting it out there. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Where's Josh in the service? <laughs> I'm joking. Worship blesses the Lord also. When we come with thanksgiving and praise and we come with our problems, when we come in a place of just surrender to the Lord, it's worship. It's beautiful. It blesses him. The one description of proskuneo was to submit in reverence. To submit in reverence. And I think some people are like, well, hmm, we under grace. You know, we don't have to do that. Like, we just under grace and it's all good. Like, we buddies with Jesus. It's actually beautiful. Surrender is actually coming and giving God your problems. It's coming and saying, Jesus, have all of me. Jesus, I can't do this. Here. Here. But some of us are holding on to our stuff and our problems and we're trying to control it. We have to submit it into his hands. Why do we raise our hands in worship? Why do we stand like this? Why? It signifies surrender. It means surrender. I don't have this. I don't have this down. I don't want to be in control of my life. Jesus have me, have my problems, have the good, the ugly, the bad, the beautiful, everything. When we lift our hands, it's surrender. Jesus, have your way. When we surrender, it makes him big. When we hold on, we make ourselves big. We make our problems big, loud. When we release it, he has the first and the last say. Worship is a part of our design. It's to magnify him, make him big. Let him be Lord in your life. Let him be Lord in your finances. Let him be Lord in your situation. Let him be Lord in your marriage. Let him have a say. <laughs> Worship is so important. Matthew 8. And it was interesting because the devil came to tempt Jesus with worship. Matthew 8. Again, the devil took Jesus up to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor and beauty. All of this I will give you. All you have to do is bow down and worship me, the devil said to Jesus. And Jesus said, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him and only him. Amen. The bigger we make him, the smaller our problems. The mountain will diminish through worship. Worship is giving our entire self, thoughts, emotions, cares, worries, hurt, pain in that moment. It's a surrender of self to God. Worship is a surrender of self to God. Worship is our God-given purpose. And where you see fear in the Bible, it's not fear and trembling and be scared of God. It's actually worship. It's come close. Come close. Lift up his name. In our pouring out, we are filled afresh with God's unrestrained, unconditional love. It satisfies. It fills our love tank up. Why? Because he's worthy. We can lift up his name no matter what we're faced with. We can worship his holy name. And I actually love, I was thinking about, I grew up in Rhema. And um, in Rhema, Obviously, COVID happens, so not many people do it these days. But people always at the front dancing and singing before Jesus. 
And sometimes, you know, like you look at them and you go, wow, they got it all together and they are happy. They clearly don't have my problems because they are dancing and having a great time before Jesus. But the truth is, those were the people at the front dancing and shouting and singing and dancing before our Lord were the ones with the biggest problems. They chose to come and dance and make a joyful noise, a shout of triumph. Because they have victory in Jesus. And I really believe, I'm like, yes, that's how we need to get. Sometimes we're so stiff in church, looking good, but we're facing big challenges. We actually just need to shove it off. If we need to kneel, if we need to dance, if we need to sing, if we need to shout with a voice of triumph over our situations because we have a savior who's paid it all. It becomes a war cry, it becomes our, our banner over our problems. So be it. So be it. It's powerful. It's powerful. Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that was in, that's within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities, who heals your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles, hallelujah. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. The Lord is merciful and gracious. He's slow to anger and abounding in mercy. So great is his mercy towards those who fear, who worship, who come close to him. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who worship him and his righteousness to children's children. Bless the Lord, all you hosts, you ministers of his who do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Blessing the Lord with our whole devotion and our whole heart. When we sing his praises, it blesses him. It reminds us that we have victory and we can sing and make a joyful noise before him. Blessing the Lord and singing praises and worship is not based on our emotion or our feelings. It's based on revelation of his finished work. It's based on what he has already done. We're not sitting here today waiting for Jesus to die on the cross again. He only needed to die once. Once and for all, he paid the price for what you're faced with right now. What you faced with. There was not one thing he left off the cross. What it is you think maybe God didn't count that he counted it all in. Everything. And that's why we can make a joyful noise. And that's why we can lift up his name. And that's why we can worship him. There's nothing that will satisfy you like worship. Lifting up his name, glorifying him and making him large and big and magnifying him. It's fulfilling because it's our design. It's what we were created for. Worship is also needing a savior. The pros proskuneo, the, the one description that said, touching the hem of his garment. And I love that. And obviously it reminds us of the story with the woman with the issue of blood. It's sometimes just saying, Jesus, help, I need you. Maybe it's even just saying, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I've been there. When I was in hospital and, and they were doing lumbar punctures on Jonathan, I, I couldn't be there. They had to remove me out the room because I was too emotional. And I just sat there and I couldn't even pray. I could not pray, I could not sing. I couldn't, all I could say was, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. And maybe you can't sing right now or you can't pray right now. Say Jesus. Call on his name. As you call on his name, you're pulling on his hem. You're pulling on everything you need, your healing, your provision, your breakthrough. The woman was there 
who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, and no one, no one could heal her. No one could fix her. And she came up behind Jesus and she touched, she just touched the edge of his cloak and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. They all denied it. Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. Someone touched me and I know the power has gone out from me. And then the woman came forward and she told why she touched him and how she had been instantly healed. And he said then to her daughter, your faith has healed you, go in peace. See, it blesses, it's called worship. It blesses the Lord when you come and you call on his name. When you call on his name, when you take from him in your need. He's healer, he's provider, he's savior. When you come to him in need of that, he sees that as beautiful. It's worship. It's everything he died to give you. It couldn't bless him more. There's another portion of scripture that also describes this and, and it speaks of worship. It was the man with leprosy. Large crowds again followed Jesus as he came down the mountain. Suddenly a man with leprosy approached him and knelt before him. Knelt before him here um, in Greek is proskuneo, it's worship. And the man said, if you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean. And Jesus reached out and touched him, I'm willing, be healed. Instantly the leprosy disappeared. When we come in our need, when we come with our condition, when we come with our lack, when we come with our questions, that's worship. It's proskuneo, taking from him. Worship is also a response to his finished work. It's also thanksgiving and gratitude. The one description of proskuneo was kissing his feet. Kissing his feet. And I really believe it, it just speaks so beautifully of just someone so grateful for all that Jesus has done. And I, the story came to mind when I saw that description. And it's John 12, and it says this. Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus, who had been dead and whom had been raised from the dead, there they had made him a supper and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with Jesus. When Mary, then Mary took a pound of very, very costly oil of spikenard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair and her tears. And the house was immediately filled with a fragrance of expensive perfume oil. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him said, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denar denarii and given to the poor? Then he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and that the money box, and had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. But Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but for me, you do not always. But what I loved about this story was Mary obviously encountered Jesus. She had been completely set free from her oppression, depression, demons, whatever, and she became a follower of Jesus. But three days before that, her brother was dead and raised to life. Now this very man, who set her free, who raised her brother from the dead, is sitting in her house, at her table. She was overflowing with gratitude. Thank you, Jesus. How good are you that you would do that for me, for my brother, for my family? She took her expensive perfume, and it was so expensive, it was worth an entire year's wage. It was costly. 
And I really believe that's what our worship looks like. When we have encountered Jesus and his finished work and his goodness and his grace, and we lift up his name, when God looks down, he sees it as costly oil that we're pouring on his son's feet, on Jesus, grateful, expensive, more than money could ever buy when we worship him, when we lift up the name of Jesus, when we're thanking him, when we're recognizing what he did on the cross, it's worth more than any money could buy. It's extravagant, it's costly, it's a sweet smelling aroma that reaches the heavenlies where our Father is seated. It blesses, it blesses him. Thanksgiving is charis in Greek. And I don't know if you've heard that word charis in Greek before. It also speaks of grace. It speaks of grace. When we start living a life of thanksgiving, a life of saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your finished work. Thank you that you died on the cross. Thank you that you died for me. When we start to recognize it and we start to thank him for that, it's living a life of grace. We become a witness to the world. Because if we're not thinking and receiving it and recognizing it, we're gonna be criticizing. We're gonna be critical. We're gonna be negative. Like Judas. I think Judas didn't fully recognize Jesus in the magnitude and the glory of who he was. He didn't receive it. He stood there criticizing when he had Jesus right in front of him. And I really believe in the world today, the world is telling us to be busy. You don't have time to worship Jesus right now. Like seriously, get to work. Like Martha, she was frustrated with Mary. She was serving, running around doing the dishes. But she had Jesus in their house. Jesus right in front of you. And I really believe in this world, in this life right now, there's always a reason why we can't sit at the feet of Jesus. There's always a reason. There's always more to do, more distractions. It's getting faster and busier. The world wants your attention. The world wants your focus. The world wants your time. So we need to choose worship. We need to be intentional with it. Jesus is right there in front of you. Make time for him. Make time to sit at his feet and receive. Make time to sing his praises. Make time to lift up his name. Even if you've woken up and it's a bad day already and everything's going wrong, get in that car, put your earphones on, whatever, and lift up his name. Choose to worship Jesus. It'll change the trajectory of your day, of your week, of your year. Lean into him. He is greater. He is faithful. Long before the devil steals your victory, he steals your song, your praise, your thanksgiving. And when we stop doing that, we become critical, critics. We become critics. We criticize, we look for fault, we look for everything we don't have. No more eating, we start tasting and spitting, and we can become bitter. And it actually says, you grow old fast living a life like that. And we read earlier, when we're thanksgiving and praising and lifting up the the name of Jesus, it renews our youth like the eagles. When we're worshiping Jesus and we're praising him, we're gonna keep looking younger, hallelujah. Are you up for that? (laughs) And we're gonna feel younger in our bodies. It's gonna renew our strength. But let's not become like the world. We're called to be witnesses. We're called to be witnesses. And that doesn't mean being perfect. But it does mean living a life of grace, of thanksgiving, of making Jesus bigger and louder in our lives, letting him be a Lord over our situation, even in the battle. He will be with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And I wanna read this over you today. Lord, it says in Psalm 34, I'm bursting with joy 
over everything you've done for me. My lips are full of perpetual praise. I'm boasting of you and all your works. So let all who are discouraged today take heart. Join me, everyone. Let's praise the Lord together. Let's make Him famous. Let's make His name glorious to all. Listen to my testimony. I cried out to God in my distress. And He answered me. He freed me from my fears. Gaze upon Him. Join your life with His. And joy will come. It will come. Your faces will glisten with glory. You'll never wear that shame face again. When I had nothing, desperate and defeated, I cried out to the Lord and He heard me, bringing His miracle deliverance when I needed it the most. The angel of Yahweh stooped down to listen as I prayed, encircling me, empowering me, and showing me how to escape. He will do that for you. He will do this for everyone who worships Him. Drink deeply of the pleasures of our God. Experience for yourself the joyous mercy He gives to all who turn to hide themselves in Him. Worship in awe and wonder, all you who have been made holy. For all who fear Him will feast plenty. Even the strong and wealthy grow weak and hungry. But those who passionately pursue the Lord will never lack any good thing. Come, children of God, and listen. I'll share the lesson I've learned of fearing the Lord. The Lord is close to all whose hearts are crushed in pain. And He is always ready to restore the repentant one. Even when bad things happen to good and godly ones, the Lord will save you and not let you be defeated by what you face. God will be your bodyguard to protect you when trouble is near. Not one bone will be broken. But the Lord has paid for the freedom of his servants and he will freely pardon those who love him. He will declare them free and innocent when they turn and hide themselves in him. We just thank you, Jesus. We thank you. We thank you for your grace. We thank you that you're close to us. We thank you that your presence is in this place today as we gathered under your name, as we lift up your name here today. I thank you that there is faith in this room, that Lord, even if there's people that have come into this room today faithless, empty, broken, defeated, there's enough faith in this room to pick them up. That's corporate worship. Where two or three are gathered, there you are. You're here. And that's what we missed in COVID, hey? Because when we're weak, we can come into a room and have no faith, but we will leave being full of faith. We will even ride on the faith in the room of others. So we just thank you, Jesus, that we can just take from you in this moment. We can lift up your name no matter what it is we're going through, that we can make you big, we can magnify your name, that you are Lord, you are God, you are faithful, you are kind, you are good, and you are faithful to your promises. You will never leave us, you will never forsake us. We're just gonna take a moment and just lean into his presence. Just for a moment this morning. You can kneel, you can sit, you can stand, you can raise your hands, but just make sure it's on Jesus. It's with him in this moment.
presence is wrapped around you right now. Just take a deep breath. Breathe them in. Sense His presence. He's closer than your breath. He's closer than your breath. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for your presence. This presence goes with us. This presence leaves with us when we walk out of the store, when we get into our car, when we're getting a, a transport or an Uber, or we're going home. This presence goes with us. We don't leave it here at church. It's with us. Engage Him. Lean into Him. Often. Every day. Walk with Him. Walk in His presence. Walk close to Him. Because He's close to you. And while every eye is closed, I want to just give everyone an opportunity. Maybe you're seated here today, or you're standing here today, or you're online, and you just say, I need this Jesus because I've been doing it all on my own and I'm tired and I'm weary and I need a savior and I need you, Jesus. We're gonna pray a prayer where you can invite Jesus into your heart to be your Lord, to be your savior, your lover, your healer, your provider, everything you need. We're gonna pray a prayer, and all you have to do is repeat after me. So we just say, thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me, for my sin, my pain, my hurt, my brokenness, my lack. You paid it all on the cross for me. So thank you, Jesus, for being my savior. Come into my life and be Lord in my life. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you, Jesus, that your presence will be tangible and evident in my life. I am a child of God. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. All of heaven is having the biggest party in heaven over you. If you prayed that prayer for the first time online, there is the biggest party, you have no idea, in heaven over that prayer because you're loved and you're a child of God and you've come home. Amen. Isn't God good? Isn't he faithful? We love you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We're gonna take communion in this moment. So just grab your little communion. If it's the first time, you can just flip it up and down. You can take the little bread out first. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We take communion often because it reminds us the work is finished. The work is finished and the bread, it represents Jesus' body for your body. His body was whipped and stripped and beaten for every sickness, every disease, anything that has a name. Autoimmune diseases, arthritis, there wasn't anything he left off the cross. There wasn't nothing. Out of those 40 whippings, it represents every sickness and disease that's alive in the earth today. It's rooted out of those 40 whips. It's represented in those 40 whips. So I want you today, I don't know if you're having symptoms in your body, if you're feeling weak, if you're feeling tired, if you're having headaches, it might be small, it might be big. It doesn't matter. I want you to close your eyes and I want you to see Jesus on the cross. I want you to see him hanging there. And I want you to see and picture your symptom on Jesus. It might be 
something with your eye, it might be a headache, it might be with an ovary, it might be with the marrow, it doesn't matter. Picture it on him. Picture it on him. Picture that growth on him. Picture it on Jesus. Because that's what he did. He took your sickness. He took your disease. He took your lack, your pain upon himself. And healing and wholeness is your right and inheritance to receive freely as a gift because of Jesus. So today, all you need to do is see that on Jesus and say thank you. Thank you for taking that on yourself. Thank you for paying the price for me. Thank you that I'm healed and whole and set free in Jesus' name by your broken body. Eat of your healing today. And his blood, his precious blood, pure, perfect, was poured out for every sin, every bit of shame, every bit of condemnation, every fear, every anxiety. He removed separation through his blood that he's never far from you. He's close, closer than your breath, close, because of his blood. You don't have to step away. You don't have to turn your face. You don't have to hide. You can lean in full-faced with Jesus, full-faced, not shame-faced, full-faced, because his blood paid the price for you. Your past, your present, and your future sin shortcomings, lack, bad decisions, it's all here. You're forgiven, you're loved, you're accepted, you're pleasing, you're a righteous child of God. Say, thank you, Jesus. I'm righteous in Christ Jesus. Receive it today. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much for watching today's Word. I know you were blessed greatly and I want to let you know if you want more resource like this, more sermons like this, they're all available for free on YouTube or on our Redemption Church app. So I want to encourage you, if it blessed you, share this link with someone else and ensure that you get more of God's goodness and Word in you. We are so excited that Redemption Church has been able to serve you with the good news of Jesus Christ today and look forward to seeing you return for more of God's goodness as we preach the word of Jesus. Be blessed.